So active surveillance, uh, you know, is getting more and more um, popular among the discussions that we're having with our patients that are uh, just coming in. And uh, what I wanted to present today is the 20-year uh, uh, update of our active surveillance program at Johns Hopkins. So on my first slide was a, a picture of Bal Carter, who uh, most of you have heard of or even know. Uh, this is his uh, work over the last two decades. Although I take care of about a third of the patients, uh, most of the uh, statistics and the data were uh, generated by Bal Carter's research group. So that's Bal Carter giving him uh, credit for what uh, I'm going to show you today. Disclosure with active surveillance, none, because you really don't do much for the patients. <laughs> Strategy for reducing overtreatment of prostate cancer is really what active surveillance was uh, originally about. But three things you have to remember about that is it is a management option um, for those patients who are fit for curative intervention. Uh, it is a selection of men who are at low risk of harm if they're not treated. And finally, if that delayed uh, curative intervention, they have to be uh, somebody who is going to benefit from that. Uh, and we're going to get into this uh, new definition. Now we uh, had for many, many years patients at low risk of progression, and now we have very low risk. So big question, uh, and this was published in 2011, a couple other papers have come out, is how often are life-threatening cancers misclassified as insignificant? And with the pathologic uh, feature of having a Gleason 7 non-organ confined or a high Gleason and or SV or lymph node involvement, uh, using the Epstein criteria for Caucasians, uh, a high-risk cancer is missed only 2% of the time. For African Americans, it was 5%. And when you throw MRI into the uh, story, uh, Turkaby published that it's about 3% uh, in a group of 133 patients. So not very often are, quote, life-threatening cancers missed by the definitions for active surveillance. We now use a lot of multiparametric MRI for our active surveillance patients, uh, one for selection, uh, trying to reduce uh, grade misclassification. And many studies have now shown that this multiparametric, which uh, we just heard about, fusion biopsy has a higher sensitivity for picking up high-grade cancers as compared to our trust-guided uh, systematic random biopsies. We also use it for monitoring. Uh, we want to reduce the number of surveillance biopsies. After a patient has had uh, five biopsies with no uh, evidence of progression, uh, we begin to use the MRI alone as a uh, method for looking if they're going to need another one. And we clearly have found out you don't have to do an MRI every year. Uh, things just don't change that fast. And that's been published by several other groups as well. These are the criteria for selection in the very low-risk category. If your PSA is less than 10, non-palpable disease, the density is less than 0.15, no Gleason 7, less than three cores, and it's on one side of the prostate. Uh, if their life expectancy is less than 20 years, uh, and again, that was a question we were getting at earlier, do you really need a, uh, an MRI? But uh, if their PSA is a little higher and they're the guy that has that really big prostate that you're worried about because his density is very low, an MRI is absolutely uh, indicated for those men. Uh, then you go to the low-risk category. Those are the T1Cs or the T2As. Gleason less than 7, PSA less than 10. Uh, if their life expectancy is less than 10, surveillance is preferred, uh, and we get MRIs on all those men. Uh, intermediate risk prostate cancer, we're not really following many of these men with uh, active surveillance, but if they have a very low life expectancy, you could or could not get an MRI before uh, doing their biopsy. And then monitoring men after they've uh, taken part in the active surveillance program, we bring them in every six months. This is an ongoing 20-year research program, so we collect uh, serum, urine, uh, do di digital rectal exams on the patients, and they kind of feel a warm, cozy feeling about being seen twice a year. Uh, our biopsies, either 12 or 14, depending on if it's, uh, as we heard just in the previous talk, something that MRI suggested you go after. Uh, we do it once a year for those patients that are low risk, 
uh, if they have a greater than 10 year life expectancy, if they're very low risk and the PSA is greater than 10, we do it every year. We do it twice a year for those men that are very low risk and there's definitely no suspicious areas on the MRI. And we get the MRI twice a year after we've decided to stop uh, getting prostate biopsies. And what are our triggers for curative intention on active surveillance? One and the most uh, common one I see is a patient's preference. Uh, after a period of time, a lot of these guys decide they're you know, beginning to get older, more comorbidities, and they're worried that they'll lose that window of opportunity. So we see a lot of patient preference. Reclassification of risk, going from low to very low. In someone that has a long life expectancy, you get a little more nervous about that. Um, or if a Gleason uh, 7 shows up. Uh, PSA at uh, 10 to 20, and they're now uh, going into the low risk category. Or if the PSA gets above 20, those are uh, the biggest trigger warnings to try to drop out of active surveillance. Just a quick look at our active surveillance cohort. The median uh, follow-up is five years, the interquartile range two to seven. About almost 7,000 person years in this cohort of 1,368 men starting in 1995. Uh, you can see the distribution by age of the very low risk men who are 70% of our cohort and the low risk which are 30%. Those of you that are familiar with uh, Lori Klotz's Toronto group, this is a totally different group of men. Uh, he has intermediate risk patients in his cohort and probably over 50% of them that are low risk, which does explain some of the differences in the uh, progression rates when you look at them. And this is looking at the whole group over the first 15 to 20 years. The dotted line is uh, biopsy reclassification by grade only, about 30%. Biopsy reclassification for any reason is about 50-some uh, percent. Uh, and then, the, obviously, the ones that reclassify, you can see in the solid gray line, are ones that end up getting treated. Looking at hazard of death, uh, almost no uh, deaths. It's, I think, less than 0.1%. And you can see death from other causes. Uh, these are relatively healthy men because only about 22% of them actually died over the, uh, from any cause over the 17-year follow-up there. This was a study we get asked a lot about, uh, uh, fluoroquinolone resistance, which is important for all biopsies, but since active surveillance patients are getting multiple prostate biopsies year after year, we were able to find out were we inducing resistance, uh, were the patients who uh, originally were resistant, did they change, or if they weren't, did it become, and this was presented by one of our Medical students is now a resident. Uh, this was at the 2014 AUA. So the rising rate of infections related to uh, prostate biopsies have led to many hospitalizations. Uh, Stacy Loeb has published uh, several good papers on this that they're worth reading. Uh, the increase is most likely due to that uh, well-known fluoroquinolone resistance in our rectal flora. Resistance rates can rise to as high as 20% in men undergoing truss biopsy. Uh, and that resistance uh, is associated with diabetes, uh, heart valve replacement, or use of the fluoroquinolone recently. Um, the longitudinal trends in resistance within the individual person were not well characterized before this study. So what we do, and we now do this for every biopsy, not just uh, active surveillance patients, patient receives a uh, rectal swab and it's plated for fluoroquinolone resistance. Uh, the patients that are coming from out of town, we've even worked out a way to mail them the culture uh, Q-tip, and they mail it back to us, and it seems to work quite well. If there's no growth, we use a fluoroquinolone for the biopsy if they're not uh, allergic to it. And then if there is a bacterial growth under fluoroquinolone culture, uh, our lab plates a, uh, a whole panel of other antibiotic uh, tablets onto it, and then gives us a report and basically tells us what we should use for their prostate biopsy. Uh, and we're using targeted prophylaxis for that. And uh, I have to tell you, uh, I probably in the last year and a half to two years, I have not seen an infection or uh, fever and shaking chills in one of our patients uh, just by this simple test. Uh, it's hard to get your lab to do it, but once you do, you'll uh, be happy about that. 
So in this study cohort, these were men in our active surveillance uh, program. Uh, the comparison group were patients that were getting prostate biopsies that weren't in the active surveillance group, and uh, they were uh, not getting the rectal swab done at that time. So here you can see the active surveillance cohort, their age, number of cultures that we obtained, and the number of resistant were pretty much the same, so it's a comparatively uh, equal group. And an interesting fact, we found that among men who were fluoroquinolone resistant on their swab, a high percentage of them were also resistant to Bactrim and, and aminoglycosides as well, uh, which uh, kind of surprised us and showed even more the importance of getting a panel instead of uh, just deciding to give everybody genomycin. This is the association of the resistance and the biopsy history in the active surveillance cohort. Uh, the median time from biopsy to swab, no difference. Trust biopsy having been performed within the last 12 months, no difference. Trust biopsy in the last six months, no difference. Uh, does this resistance uh, increase with increasing number of biopsies? And you can see across the bottom men getting from one to seven prostate biopsies. It doesn't appear that there's more fluoroquinolone resistance in uh, the patients that got seven versus the one that got one, and the p-value was only 0.1. Factors associated with the resistance, just uh, most important, diabetes was really, among this cohort, the only significant finding associated with the resistance. 4.5% of those that were sensitive versus 15.7% of those that were resistant. And under multivariate analysis, diabetes was a significant factor. So uh, these are the men you want to pay close attention to. So in the group, looking at the data real quickly, 416 men, 23% resistant, 77% sensitive. Uh, all the men underwent a uh, second uh, swab. And of those that were resistant, uh, 76 were still resistant. Uh, of those that uh, were sensitive to fluoroquinolones under the second swab for their second biopsy, we still had 91% of them stayed sensitive. It appears that once you uh, obtain resistance, it probably sticks with you. Uh, and if you're sensitive on the first, you're very likely to still be sensitive on the next. We also do one for every biopsy, though. So in conclusion, one in four men uh, presenting for prostate biopsy at our institution were resistant to fluoroquinolone. Uh, the resistance rates were not higher among the men in the active surveillance compared to men undergoing their initial diagnostic biopsies. Multi -bi multiple biopsies were not associated with increased fluoroquinolone resistance. Diabetes was the number one risk factor. And most men that carried the fluoroquinolone resistance remained resistant over time. So just to summarize quickly, we initiated the program in 1995. Uh, as of September 2014, there were about 1,300 men. We showed you the follow-up in the person years. Uh, it's quite a large cohort right now. Uh, it really changes your practice, I'll tell you. Uh, all these men have to keep coming back every six months to see you, and it's a lot of prostate biopsies. And that's our distribution with low and very low. Uh, we already looked at these classification rates, but you can see the numbers one more time uh, over 5, 10, and 15 years based on any reason, grade, and our treatment rate uh, gets up higher. Men with favorable risk disease, consider active surveillance should be informed uh, that they have about a 4 to 6 percent of reclassification to high grade, about a only 1 percent chance of death over the 15-year period. Um, and We've already covered that. And this is the group that works on the active surveillance that uh, Johns Hopkins and Val Carter runs it. 